Well, this ought to be interesting. Part of the animating impetus behind Really That Good is the paradox that many of our most beloved pop culture institutions are also among our least well understood and least properly discussed precisely because they're so beloved. So much of the modern, postmodern, really critical discourse is about recontextualizing and reclaiming works that have been overlooked and pushed aside that we often assume the universally accepted canon is either already well understood enough or became universally accepted precisely because there never was a lot to unpack there. The Travel Channel wasn't going to parachute the late Anthony Bourdain into the M&M's factory to spend an hour working out why people enjoy bite-sized chocolates with candy shells. My thought process when creating Really That Good, however, was that this way of thinking when it came to our beloved movies was not only misguided that there were interesting cultural, thematic, political, and socio-political depths within popular cinema that played an important role in why a given work was enduringly popular, but that the assumption was cheating out of potentially interesting discourse in and of itself. That even if, say, The Matrix didn't need reappraisal as subversive allegory for millennial gender identity politics, pop culture on the receiving side was missing out by not having the discussion widely circulate. Not like this. Not like this. I happen to believe that I remain correct in this viewpoint, but I also acknowledge that there are exceptions to everything, and the glaring exception to this scenario is called Star Wars. <laughs> Well, indeed, often credited alongside Jaws with kickstarting the era of high concept, turn off your brain, subtext, what subtext blockbuster filmmaking, the supreme irony is that Star Wars is quite possibly the most analyzed, most discussed, most picked apart, theorized about, academically studied, fan theoried, universe expanded, dissected, deconstructed, obsessively obsessed over work of mainstream filmmaking, perhaps even mainstream art ever created. We'll talk more about some of this, but just in the broader strokes, an entire generation of Western film geeks discovered Akira Kurosawa's samurai melodrama, rediscovered the classic Flash Gordon series, and became overnight devotees of mythology scholar Joseph Campbell largely because they discovered that they were the building blocks of Star Wars. Studio executives who used to talk about beats, butts in seats, and will it play in Peoria started grilling screenwriters about a given project's ability to track with the hero's journey or the allegory of the cave. The debate over lines of demarcation separating science fiction from fantasy burst out of the hobby shop and into the mainstream, or at least the foyer of the hobby shop. You'll never be satisfied with a mortal woman because the elf wenches are so beautiful, you'll spend the rest of your life searching for that same beauty again. <sniffs> yes. Wow. You're an idiot. In other words, all of the context of broader culture and or cultural impact stuff that's usually the fun, unexplored regions of a subject for really that good have all been well and truly picked clean when it comes to Star Wars as a franchise. Kid, I've flown from one side of this galaxy to the other. I've seen a lot of strange stuff. I mean, let's face it. Once will the made-up space meditation from this movie be recognized globally as an actual religion before or after Disney finishes turning a sizable chunk of Orlando, Florida real estate into Planet Coruscant as a legitimate question? There's just not a lot of new ground left to cover. But on the other hand, a long time ago, Star Wars was not ubiquitous. There was no before to draw on, no prequel, no sequels to be looked forward to, no expanded universe, no forums, no fellow fanboys, no nothing. There was just a movie, a single, individual, isolated, very, very unique movie doing a whole bunch of stuff that no one had ever seen done exactly that way that had to sink or swim entirely on its own merits and did, better and bigger than anyone had ever seen before. Just try and wrap your mind around that for a minute, because it's harder than you think until you actually try. When Star Wars premiered on May 25th, 1977, that was all there was. That was it. Just the flyover, the two droids crashing on Tatooine, meeting Luke and Obi-Wan, hooking up with Han and Chewie, saving the princess, dive-bombing the Death Star, getting their medals, that was all the Star Wars. No one knew who Luke's father was, Yoda didn't even exist yet, neither did Boba Fett, we hadn't seen the Emperor, no one had any idea about anything that happened in the prequels or what the Clone Wars even referred to. Hell, depending on who you ask and in what context, it's not even 100% clear what Lucas had even followed all this stuff out. The biggest problem I had is it just wasn't going fast enough and I was running out of money. Irving Kershaw was an extremely good director, but the film went over budget, went over schedule, and all the money I had in Star Wars was was committed to this film plus more. And yet this relatively simple, straightforward narrative taking place over a few days with a handful of main characters and no significant loose ends by the standard of any other 1970s ongoing war story, science fiction or not, enraptured audiences of the day so completely that it transformed the popular culture of several entire nations overnight before they even bothered to talk about a sequel. People went back to see it dozens of times. Kids bought action figures of characters who only appeared in one scene. Audiences tuned in to watch the holiday special. Not for irony, they just had to have more Star Wars stuff. Without being too cute about it, Star Wars was big before it was Star Wars. Back when it was just Star Wars. Just one more drop, friend. Before we stop, friend. One more moment face to face. 
was it good? Remember, despite what the cinephile intelligentsia would have you believe, not every film that burned up the box office in the sainted auteur era of the holy 1970s was an artistic triumph. Dumb, pandering, spectacle-driven junk both existed and made big money before George Lucas and Steven Spielberg came along, and there is a narrative out there that holds up Star Wars as being merely pretty good, kinda average example thereof that was in the right place at the right time and that we wouldn't still talk about it in such glowing terms or even at all if The Empire Strikes Back hadn't been a substantially richer experience and if the franchise hadn't become so omnipresent in the intervening years. So that's what we're going to do in this installment. Cut out all the noise of everything that came after, to the degree that that's even possible since we're not doing a hypothetical alternate reality here, and look at the film that started it only in terms in and of itself. Its own story, its qualities, its own flaws, its own moment in time. Is Star Wars, the original Star Wars, really that good? You know, sometimes I amaze even myself. That doesn't sound too hard. At first glance, this sounds like it should be easy. Just look back at the first Star Wars. For posterity's sake, we're talking and working from the original pre-special edition version here, guys, just a heads up, and review it without bringing up the prequel trilogy, the sequels, the spin-offs, the TV shows, the expanded universe, and A New Hope. I don't know what A New Hope is. The movie's called Star Wars. But it's not actually that simple, because the fundamental question we're getting at is whether or not the film would still work as a competent, watchable space movie, even if you didn't have the lore reaching back to the prequels, the KOTOR games to give things mythic heft, and later revelations about Luke's parentage and the full scope of the Empire and the Force to give general ethereal presence here dramatic portent. I mean, of course it does. It wouldn't have been a big hit if it hadn't. I see your point, sir. And yet it's sort of a small thing, isn't it? And I don't just mean the relative scale of just two planets, three if we're counting the Death Star, three main characters played by then-nobodies, one paycheck-collecting living legend in a supporting role, three comedy sidekicks, one big villain, one little villain, very few tertiary characters otherwise who legitimately qualify as characters in the actual on-page and on-screen sense, as opposed to eventually years later we gave this person a name, a trading card, action figure, and series of bad tie-in novel sense, and an extremely thinly sketched background mythology in which bad guys who look like bad guys and have scary, unfamiliar titles like Darth or Grand Moff are opposed by good guys with familiar titles like Princess and Knight, and the Force is a really vague, pseudo-religious concept with very limited applications. I mean, all that's true, and we'll talk about why it actually works in its favor, but it's also the opposite of Portentous. For all the dramatic build-up attached to that famous opening title crawl, Star Wars is a really lean, quick, fast-moving film, moving important information and or people from one place to another before the clock runs out in the context of a small-scale, hastily assembled crew on a mission war flick. It sells itself as a mere glimpse at a single moment in a sprawling hypothetical epic which at the time only existed in a a hazy, tenuous theory, then spawned an actual epic that was sort of similar to what Lucas had at one point envisioned for it by conjuring the sense of an epic and a desire for more in the audience, but Star Wars is definitely not Lawrence of Arabia in space. At the most, it's the taking of a Kaaba sequence from Lawrence of Arabia in space blown out to feature length, and even then with like a tenth of the manpower. Not that a film needs to be an epic to be great, but the association is often made that way for a reason, so that's interesting. I don't like the look of this. In any case, we're not here to say, well, duh, to any questions, even about Star Wars, so we may as well start asking them, and there's no better place to start than at the beginning. Just for the record, I'm fully aware that this will certainly end up being a lot of people's least favorite or least satisfying episode of this series. It's kind of unavoidable given the build-up and the fact that so much is already known and written about the history and making of Star Wars that finding a new angle to come at it from it's actually exciting is basically impossible, which is more or less why I opted for quirky and experimental instead. Basically, if you came on board hoping for a retread of production trivia and famous facts and that sort of thing, honestly, there's a different show where dozens of books or other people have already written. Before the dark times. Before the Empire. What I'm concerned with here is what exists within the frame and what spilled out on screen back in 77, and in that respect, what you can't lose sight of is that for what was itself very much an experimental film, Star Wars has the basics down really, really well. For all the justifiable criticism of George Lucas as an overly quixotic and offbeat auteur with a tendency to get lost in the minutia of his own creation, what he and his collaborators offered up with this initial outing works in large part because it manages to ground a boundless sense of imagination with solid, tried-and-true, nuts-and-bolts quality filmmaking. Gilbert Taylor's shot compositions are immaculate, the blocking and placement of actors is adept, the 
visual storytelling is clean and clear, even as it's telling what was for the time an incredibly unusual story. The use of Ben Burtt's soundscape is famously nothing short of revolutionary, especially in terms of how much of the sound was created exclusively for this film. Actually, that's true of the entire look of the thing. Any Star Wars fan worth their salt will tell you that one of the key factors that helped make it so innately memorable and contributed to the timeless factor on which my entire thesis here pivots is that Lucas was insistent on not repurposing props or costumes or going stock sounds and effects wherever possible, which at the time was a huge break, not just with the sci-fi fantasy filmmaking tradition, but with the genre filmmaking period. It's important to remember, wow, I'm kind of editing as I go here and I'm doing my best to cut it as often as I can, but it's very likely you're going to get extremely sick of me saying it's important to remember during this no matter how many times I catch it, so sorry about that. <laughs> that prior to Star Wars, Hollywood filmmaking generally put such a low premium on the originality of effects and design aesthetics in genre film, we'll talk more about that extensively in the next section, that the career crossover between film directing and the fine arts world was so limited that today the familiar notion of a sci-fi project happening because a filmmaker wanted to get a visual vision on screen was not part of the cinematic language. As in the perhaps apocryphal story of the Wachowskis getting a yes on The Matrix by showing Joel Silver some action clips from Ghost in the Shell and saying we can do that but with real people wasn't a thing in the 70s, and it certainly wasn't how Lucas originally approached Star Wars. His original drafts and notes, while indeed revolutionary in multiple respects, were very much of a kind to literate science fiction of their day, heady, esoteric, ethereal, with one foot planted firmly in the mind's eye realm of feeling as thought narrative, more concerned with mapping out the complex web of characters, histories, and hierarchies than with what anything looked like or how it was supposed to work unless essential to the immediate story. And even then, not really. It's hard to explain, but suffice to say there's a particular rhythm of descriptive prose that scream director is going to be his own screenwriter in terms of what one thinks of as important detail versus not. It got to be a very fat script, about 200 pages, and the story had gotten away from me. So the only way I could cope with it was to say, I'll take the first third, the first act, and I'll make that into a movie. But I'd written all this other stuff. I'd spent a year writing this story, and I said, well, I'm not going to just throw away two-thirds of my year and say, this is all I can afford at this point, this is the only amount of money I'm going to get us to do this one movie. Nonetheless, he recognized that it needed to both look and sound different than any film that had come before it, but also that, however paradoxically, it needed to be familiar, that the characters and aesthetics could go off in exponentially more unusual directions if they were consistently anchored in concepts, reference points, and general terminology that the audience did understand. To be sure, this is the oldest writing shortcut in science fiction and fantasy. Make the new thing you're making up remind people directly or indirectly of something they already understand, then they can fill in the blanks. This is sort of like how Star Trek's solution to how do we sell people on what this Starfleet world-building concept is, especially considering since it's the early 60s, half of our writers clearly aren't on the same page as to things like what does a computer do, boiled down to, it's the Navy but in space and the Enterprise is a battleship except when it's a submarine. Star Wars, of course, is also a Navy story but about the fighter pilots instead of the ship's crew, but we'll talk about that later. L. Ron Hubbard was a Navy guy too. Mid-20th century sci-fi and boats are definitely a thing. See also, not just Jedi, but Jedi Knight. Oh, okay, I don't know what the hell a Jedi is, but Knight, ah yeah, chivalry, honor, codes, mythic, ancient. These aren't just soldiers. Something older and historic happen in here. Yeah, got it. Han Solo was specifically wanted for smuggling. Oh, okay, like a bush pilot. All right, I've got a rough sketch of how this side of their economy works. Mos Eisley doesn't just have a bar, but a cantina, because that's how you knew the action had moved into lawless Mexico in a cowboy movie, and thus tells you that this dark, unfamiliar space full of alien faces and strange languages is coded dangerous for unassuming blonde farm boy Luke. They're, uh, they're not all positive examples, folks. <clears throat> Anyway, out by the speeder, we don't want any trouble. I heartily agree with you, sir. And speaking of Luke, those characters, right? This, more than anything, is where you'd think Star Wars would be found retroactively wanting as a singular experience. It's a lean, quick, fast-moving, surprisingly economical feature works in its favor in nearly every other respect, sure, but it must mean that the characters aren't actually compelling as we think of them now because there's hardly any time for us to get to know them, especially since this is a franchise whose ability to sell off its own fixtures is so all-encompassing that millions of people recognize this random humanoid walrus, own his action figure, maybe have him on a t-shirt, and know his name is Ponda Baba, even though this was the entirety of his screen time prior to Rogue One. <laughs> he doesn't like you. Sorry. I don't like you either. You just watch yourself. We want it men. I have the death sentence on 12 systems. I'll be careful. You'll be dead. This little one's not worth the effort. Come, let me get you something. After all, even the main characters are sketched in pretty broad strokes, Luke has a vagueish wanderlust, attaches a newly acquired goal onto it, and accomplishes it. That's not so much an arc as it is an incline. Leia also doesn't really experience what you'd call development, she's an exposition machine and a human MacGuffin with an agreeable payoff as a late 70s proto-feminist punchline. Hey, we saved the princess from the dungeon! <laughs> 
give us kids. And now she's actually pretty all set now that we gave her a gun and she's got kind of an attitude on her. I take orders from just one person, me. So one day you're still alive. Will somebody get this big walking carpet out of my way? Obi-Wan Kenobi is Coruscanti for there's a whole lot of half-baked made-up space bullshit in the backstory that needs to sound weighty and important if the main protagonist's big moment at the finale is gonna pay off right, and it's pretty much gonna take one of the greatest living actors of stage and screen to pull off, so showtime, Sir Alec. What have I done? And look, everyone by this point has had their fun joking around about Alec Guinness phoning it in for Star Wars, none more so or earlier than Alec Guinness himself, but whatever you want to believe, the version where he thought this was ridiculous and couldn't wait to get it over with, or the version where he was having a good time for a little while, he's a plot device and a plot explainer, classing up the joint by being the only Shakespearean in the cast not marking time on the Death Star. And Han actually does have an arc! He doesn't really have any depth to inform it beyond feeling more familiar and normal than the rest of the characters in subtle but important ways, but it's there. Han is actually sort of the key to this in fairly interesting ways, but that's going to need some more forthcoming context, so please, patience. Who is this? What's your operating number? Uh, boring conversation anyway. In any case, when you consider that at this point we didn't have Han and Leia's fully developed back and forth, any kind of real sense of what Obi-Wan and Vader meant to each other, or even what Vader even was, apart from the other Imperials kinda not being on board for the whole dark space wizard thing. Your sad devotion to that ancient religion has not helped you conjure up the stolen data tapes, or given you clairvoyance enough to find the rebels' hidden fort. Obi-Wan's death didn't yet echo backward to Qui-Gon or forward to old Luke, Anakin's lightsaber hadn't been invested with significance apart from the obvious King Arthur illusion, we didn't know this was kinda weird yet. Bottom line, if you're accustomed to thinking of Star Wars in terms of the grand, sweeping space opera franchise, it's easy to notice that there isn't a lot of meat to hook into in the first movie, which is how some fairly thoughtful analyses over the years have come to take the position that it is just a lighter-than-air yet undeniably imaginative action movie pushed just far enough over the finish line by ILM's next-level visuals and engaging main cast who were compelling enough to connect with the audience at exactly the right moment in time when that connection could set off a pop culture powder keg. Does there even need to be more to it than that? No, not really. Do I think there is more to it than that? If I didn't, I'd be doing something else right now. You're probably expecting the digging deeper would start with acknowledging the visuals and special effects as only the surface of a feature and move quickly into the substance, narrative, and theme. Well, we're not going to do that. Star Wars' biggest and most lasting change to genre filmmaking was to its visual language, and that much is immediately apparent when you consider that a big-budget Hollywood sci-fi action movie released the year before Star Wars looked like this. Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer presents the Saul David production of Logan's Run. A fantastic journey through a world beyond imagination. <laughs> well, the next sci-fi action movie released from a Hollywood studio of equivalent size looked like this. Well, as is known and previously stated, ILM and others did indeed invent and refine new techniques to create revolutionary visual effects of the original Star Wars, they didn't simply emerge from nowhere. Visual effects technology had evolved in sophistication along with every other technical aspect of Hollywood filmmaking. You can see it on display in the massive spectacles rendered for disaster films and historical epics in the 60s and 70s. It was just that no one wanted to spend that kind of money on fantastical sci-fi for the most part because the audience was either thought to be children or undiscerning grindhouse filmgoers who didn't care about production value and weren't numerous enough to draw big sales or big stars, so the genre spent much of the mid 20s century divided paradoxically in half. Spectacle sci-fi generally got lower effects budgets despite having more effects sequences, while adult skewing intellectual sci-fi got bigger budgets despite typically featuring fewer or more subtle uses of visual trickery. What Lucas ultimately accomplished with Star Wars was on the technical front unifying the two, bringing A-list budget and thus an A-tier release platform to justify the cost of what was seen as B-list material, which was really just a continuation of the general philosophy of his so-called film school generation of filmmakers, a philosophy grounded in the same genre film reappraisals of the Cahiers de Cinema auteur theory movement. And understanding that 
is, I believe, key to both appreciating the original Star Wars on a deeper level and also correcting the common misunderstanding of its true place in modern film history. And while the full, complex, messy history of Cahiers de Cinema and auteur theory are, well, full, complex, and messy, a brief refresher is probably in order. Cahier de Cinéma, it just means notebooks about movies, is a French film magazine generally regarded as one of, if not the most prestigious periodicals on the subject in the world and still making waves today, having just this year caused a sensation of controversy in the contemporary cinematic discourse by naming David Lynch's Twin Peaks The Return as its best film of the decade, despite that being, you know, a television series. In any case, Cahier de Cinéma was founded in 1951 by André Bazin, Jacques Planel Valcos, and Joseph Marie Laduca, and gained its greatest notoriety variety as the home-based publication for the respected writers and editors on the subject of film who subsequently went on to prove their mettle as some of the greatest filmmakers of their own generation, including Jean-Luc Godard, François Truffaut, Jacques Rovette, Claude Chabrol, and others later associated with the French New Wave. I uh, apologize to my late grandmother and her sisters for what I've done to those beautiful French names with my horrible pronunciation. Pardonnez-moi, grand-mère, j'étais toujours tout le marquant. As writers at Cahier, Truffaut, Godard, and their New Wave compatriots were instrumental in effectively recontextualizing the entire academic view of primarily Western film history by adamantly rejecting the idea that the collaborative nature of filmmaking precluded films themselves from being analyzed as works of singular artistic vision, instead framing the director as the ideal primary author of a given film and thus pushing for academic film study to shift from focus on films that typify the effectiveness of the collaborative studio system like Golden Age musicals and other lavish producer-driven productions to more idiosyncratic director of Fair, like the filmographies of both long-respected players like John Ford, but also those once dismissed as commercial panderers like Alfred Hitchcock, Douglas Sirk, and of course quixotic gadflies like Orson Welles, which is of course how well-regarded in their day, but somewhat forgotten at the time films like Vertigo, Magnificent Obsession, and of course Citizen Kane suddenly became contenders for greatest of all time lists in the 60s and 70s. Pushing further into what their American compatriot Andrew Serres would later dub auteur theory, the Cahier de Cinema critics would argue that the under focus on consistent directorial voice had led Hollywood film historians to undervalue the artistic contributions of filmmakers who had specialized in the so-called B-movie genre, such as the gangster film, horror film, low-budget westerns, thrillers, monster movies, and of course science fiction, where these smaller crews and tighter schedules often meant a greater directorial freedom and a more consistently visible directorial signature, which through the prism of the auteur theory framework hypothetically indicates a singularity of authorial vision and a distinct aesthetic purpose. So, yeah. Now that is, of course, a simplified version of how all of that played out. Auteur theory had many more nuanced permutations as it continued to evolve, and also plenty of well-argued pushbacks from the likes of Pauline Kael and others in its day, along with quite a bit of modern criticism as to, just for example, how cavalierly its implicitly macho idealism of the hyper-individualist singular author minimized the, in some respects, and by no means ideal, gender parity of the studio era versus the overwhelming whiteness and maleness of what came to be elevated as the auteur canon, all fair and relevant points. But for the purpose of our discussion here, auteur theory changed the study and popularity of filmmaking in much the same way that Method and the rise of Brando and Dean had transformed film acting, and if you were paying close attention and connecting the dots in your head, you already know how this fits into the discussion. By the time auteur theory established itself as the official cool kid film school religion that bonded the Southern California clique that blew open and ultimately blew out the 70s into the blockbuster era, for many would-be directors it had been condensed down to a pair of ultra-potent bullet points. The director is omnipotent rock star storyteller art god and trashy weird B-movie stuff that you'd been big into as a kid and or geeky teenager actually had real artistic merit. Do you want George Lucas's? Cause that's how you get George Lucas's. That's how you get ants! In the timeline of 20th century film history, Star Wars is typically positioned as part of the birth of the blockbuster moment that marked the end of the experimental 70s and the rebirth of the studio system, and as such tends to be paired alongside Spielberg's Jaws as a one-two punch of big-budget reworkings of formerly juvenile genre fare of the type that would come to dominate multiplexes thereafter. Smile, you son of a bitch! <laughs> but there's a competing view of that era, one I'm increasingly given to subscribe to, that takes a broader view wherein the blockbuster has a more organic rise that actually begins with the unexpectedly massive ticket sales for the youth-targeted love story during Robert Evans' tenure as the head of Paramount, which helped lead to his production of The Godfather, which in turn established Coppola, whose influence begets Lucas Spielberg, so on and so forth. And viewed apart from the biases of or against genre film, both Jaws and Star Wars have at least as much in common with The Godfather as they do with each other. All three represent boomer filmmakers following their interpretations of the edicts of auteur 
theory by taking disreputable genre material of the past, sci-fi serials, monster movies, gangster movies, and reworking them on a grand operatic scale attuned to the idiosyncrasies of the auteur filmmakers themselves. Coppola's sweeping humanism, Spielberg's precision time grasp of film language, and Lucas, well, to be honest, I think that more than anything, what Lucas gifted to Star Wars was that George Lucas is one weird guy. Oh, this is terrible. You, know, you shouldn't show this to an audience. It's embarrassing, all that kind of stuff. And I don't mean that in some disparaging way. The most remarkable thing about Lucas being the filmmaker who discovered the Rosetta Stone of late 20th century mainstream pop culture mass marketing is that he is a thoroughly non-mainstream person, or at least as non-mainstream as a suburban white kid from Southern California at film school in the 70s could be under the circumstances. When you look at things like his original drafts for Star Wars and every version of THX 1138, it's almost startling how much closer he seems in filmmaking sensibility to David Lynch or John Borman, an esoteric weirdo who approaches narrative in terms of rhyming story beats and tone poems, attempts environmental storytelling with wholly artificial environments, and seems to regard conceiving the emotional reactions of made-up alien creatures and actual humans like himself as equally difficult screenplay challenges. How strange that this is where Star Wars, the widely beloved, incredibly accessible, all-ages, most marketable movie franchise of all time came from, until, as you're doing here, we go back and watch just the first one in isolation and recognize that part of what blew people's minds open for all of the stuff to pour in and colonize the imaginations of a generation is that this was a really new, different, bizarre movie. In fact, it's probably the most aesthetically different of the Star Wars films apart from Rogue One, and the most narratively subversive until... Oh. Yes, in part because it feels very much like a 70s movie with the deliberately paced first act, heavy reliance on conversational pitch, ADR dialogue, and zoomed-in cinematography, a grainier overall shooting stock, more naturalistic exterior scenes, especially on Tatooine, and that whole general Great American Hangover vibe that permeated the 70s in general, but also because it is, in spite of all the compromises he's reputed to have made, a George Lucas movie. Infused with the same hazy, dreamlike spirit and willingness to flaunt the rules of cinematic structure, even while adhering to mythic structure that was present in THX's Nightmare Dystopia, and American Graffiti's half-remembered deluge of fevered teenage nostalgia. Think about how the opening shot to the ships cruising overhead aims to throw the audience off guard by distorting our sense of physical space, how we're dropped in media res into a shootout with almost no context as to who's killing who, save for a title crawl that pretends like we're supposed to know what happened beforehand. Then when the camera framing finally shows us a character we're apparently meant to share a viewpoint with, it's this weird gold robot creature who's even more confused about what the hell is going on than we are. R2-D2, where are you? And then we find his buddy, an even more robot-y looking robot, to ask him to clarify the situation. Where have you been? They're heading in this direction. What are we going to do? We'll be sent to the spice mines of Kessel or smashed into who knows what. Wait a minute. Oh great, he speaks a robot language we don't get to understand. I mean, imagine it's opening night and you're watching this as someone who hadn't previously been marinating the weirder quarters of the sci-fi genre up to this point, which is actually a more substantive portion of the audience than we conventionally think of, but we'll get to that later. You're probably a bit lost here, right? As in, uh, honey, are you following this? I thought this was a space movie we were going to see, but one of the astronauts is a princess for some reason, and now we're here with these two robots looking for skibbity boobity somebody? What's your middle name? Scooby Dooby. Ooby doob scooby dooby banooby? One and the same. And one of them just makes beeping sounds? Is this a kid's movie? Because it seems like it's a kid's movie, but a bunch of guys just got shot, and I think the black helmet man just killed a guy? If this is a consular ship, where is the ambassador? <laughs> So, are the robots the main people, I guess? Oh, oh wait, okay, now there's these guys, I guess they'll explain what's going on. Oh, okay. So, so how much of this movie is going to be robots and Muppets making weird noises at each other? Because this is a lot weirder than I thought. Oh, okay, a blonde kid. All right, this must be the main guy. Huh, wow, that seemed to take a while. Luke, Uncle, if he gets a translator, be sure it speaks Bocce. Doesn't look like we have much of a choice, but I'll remind him. Yeah, go ahead and mark it. Luke Skywalker does not enter Star Wars at all until about 15 minutes into the film. That's how long it takes the main character of all three original films to show up when without any indication that we're supposed to be waiting for him unless you saw the trailer. He's not in the title crawl, he's not mentioned prior to this, we're not told he's an important guy because he's not, they haven't made that part up yet. He's not even who the two robots were here to find in the first place. You just kind of have to take it from the soundtrack cue when Luke 
goes out to look at the twin sunsets after he's all, Uncle Owen, I want to answer the call to adventure. And Uncle Owen is all, you can answer the call to adventure when your chores are done, rah. And now the audience is hopefully all on the same page with the scenario here. Oh, okay, it's a movie about a kid on a farm who wants to go fly planes in the war, like a Red Baron type movie. Okay, now I got a handle on this. But it takes a comparatively long way around to getting you there, and it's a very deliberate shock to the system kind of way. The level of sunk in, you are in a whole other universe strangeness that Lucas is going for here to capture as best he felt able. The sense of experiencing this tiny slice of a bigger dream world still taking shape as he was filming it could only be possibly achieved by getting the audience to absorb and accept it as quick as possible, and the best way to do that is to force it on them. Star Wars drops the viewer into the middle of the story and basically tells them to feel their way through and eventually things will start to make sense because you grab onto familiar looking or sounding concepts or things you see or hear more than once and make connections, sort of like visiting a foreign country for the first time where you don't speak the language, you work it out. Can you speak Bocce? Of course I can, sir. It's like a second language to me. I'm a yeah, Alright, shut up. I'll take this. Shut, shut up, up, sir. But it doesn't stop messing with the narrative rules even within its own genre. Now, I know we're trying as best we can not to call ahead to the other movies, but there really is no better way to explain this. You know how the fandom is still melting down because in the last Objection! Sustained! When Ray finally hands Luke Anakin's lightsaber and he just goes like And okay, that's meant to be unexpected there, deliberate subversion of tropes, etc., whatever, this isn't a video about The Last Jedi. Well, when was the last time you went back and watched the scene where Luke first gets that lightsaber from Obi-Wan in the first place, which is also the first time we've ever seen a lightsaber in the history of motion pictures? Not as clumsy or random as a blaster. An elegant weapon, but a more civilized age. For over a thousand generations, the Jedi Knights were the guardians of peace and justice in the Old Republic. Before the dark times. Before the Empire. Yeah, that's it. The old guy takes it out of a box and hands it to him like no big deal, and Luke Skywalker lights up what might be the single greatest practical contribution of Star Wars to the genre itself, the most badass science fiction weapon of all time, a sword with a pop-out blade made of lasers that can cut through anything except other swords made of lasers, a space-age version of an archangel's flaming sword, and he just kind of twirls it around a few times like, oh hey, this is different, and then he puts it away and they go right back into the backstory exposition. How did my father die? No break in the casual Altman-esque take, no cut to close-up, no key light on the reflective surface of the handle so we know where to look, no indication at all that this is anything special even though it clearly is. And no, I'm not further breaking my own conceit here because this wouldn't actually be special yet because of the fact that this is Anakin Skywalker's blue lightsaber lost at his turn to the dark side on Mustafar, soon to be lost in turn by Luke on Bespin and later rediscovered by Rey. No, the Western mythological traditional illusion here is enough. This is a boy seemingly of common birth being entrusted with a token symbolizing the noble warrior heritage of his father by a wizard. This is Merlin, Arthur, Sword in the Stone, and or Excalibur. What is it? Your father's lightsaber. This is the weapon of a Jedi Knight. The metaphor is unmistakable. It's obviously a big deal. Even without the mythic allegory, it's the introduction of a signature totemic weapon. The tradition of cinematic language generally denotes that those should get a close-up, an establishing shot, or at least their own music cue. But not in Star Wars, at least not at this point in Star Wars, where it still feels very much like a film of the late 70s rather than of the early 80s. And a wizard is just some kind of weird, blissed out mystic living in a hut, thank you JR. Though it's still sort of both and we'll come back to that. For now, I want to stay on this theme of forcing the audience to subsume itself into the universe, which again, is all the more impressive when you remember that however big and elaborate this initial esoteric concept was, Lucas was still pretty much making this stuff up as he went along. No, oh, my father didn't fight in the wars, he was a navigator on a spice freighter. That's what your uncle told you. He didn't hold with your father's ideals, thought he should have stayed here and not gotten involved. 
The audience is so profoundly lost amid the sheer alienness of what's all around them from the moment Star Wars begins that the film can exploit their instinct to grasp at anything familiar as narrative shorthand, and all that weirdness with the spaceships and Vaders and droids and Jawas and sandcrawlers, the fact that we're able to immediately identify Luke and his relatives as some kind of farmers is familiar enough that everything about them and their surroundings feels like a safe, grounded homestead without having to spend too much time establishing it. Speaking of familiarity, no sooner does the audience finally seem to have been given a tangible grasp of where we are what's going on and who to root for, i.e. we've got a rough sketch of the villain's plan and a broader power structure. The Rebellion will continue to gain a support in the Imperial Senate. The, the Imperial long... Senate will no longer be of any concern to us. I have just received word that the Emperor has dissolved the Council permanently. The last remnants of the Old Republic have been swept away. We've got a theoretically relatable protagonist, a mentor figure to provide mythos, backstory and context, some dead people to avenge to get the old stakes raised, everything gets super alien and otherworldly again, because we drop Luke and company into the cantina scene and oh my god, what the hell is even happening? The movie turned all freaking weird again. Now this does serve to keep the audience on its toes and reinforce that this is a big strange universe and something bizarre is always potentially right around the corner, but the subtle fact that we are completely adrift in this place, Luke is only mostly out of place and Obi-Wan rolls in like a boss. <laughs> doubly reinforces that there's a distinct layer of unreality separating us from even these supposedly relatable protagonists. Yes, we're even a little bit alienated from Luke. All-American golden boy or not, you need to remember that even as late as 1977, a main character written and acted as young as Luke is was still kind of a new thing, or at least something that hadn't been seen at this level of Hollywood filmmaking in quite a while. Big box office takes or not, a lot of the pop culture establishment was still not willing to accept the idea of serious movies being headlined by teenagers and 20-something characters even after a decade of movies like like The Graduate, Love Story, The Heartbreak Kid packing theaters, and doing a boy goes off to war story with more or less a literal boy definitely felt like something that belonged to an earlier era of cinematic or even literary storytelling. In fact, up to this point in the movie, many audiences seeing Star Wars for the first time who were actively working to put what was unfolding into some kind of context were likely to conclude it was wholly a creature of retro cinema reference, mashing together old-time science fiction, old-time war movies, and old-timey medieval swashbuckling adventure. Incidentally, this was the point where movies actively referencing older movies was becoming a common thing for the first time because the first generation that had grown up with old movies regularly showing on TV was hitting adulthood on both sides of the camera, aka the baby boomers. So it wouldn't have been unreasonable to assume that Star Wars would be one of these slightly detached, one step outside the contemporary movies where everyone and everything was affecting a sense of being from a different time, or rather the general Hollywood conception of different times. Obi-Wan and Vader were acting like something out of a King Arthur movie. Luke and the various military characters were doing kind of a Dawn Patrol reference, a couple Lauren Hardy type robots, an old time princess to rescue all held together by a fancy retro upgraded sci-fi skin. But then, at just over the 45 minute mark, Star Wars unleashes a secret weapon. No, a, a metaphorical one. Han Solo, I'm Captain of the Millennium Falcon. Han freaking Solo. Yes, he's a badass. Yes, he's handsome. Yes, he gets all the best lines. Sorry about the mess. Here's where the fun begins. Boring conversation anyway. She's got it where it counts, kid. I don't have it with me. I got a bad feeling about this. Great kid! Don't get cocky! Maybe you'd like it back in your cell, your highness. Yes, I bet you have. <laughs> Yes, it's hard to believe that not only did Hollywood not know what to do with Harrison Ford before this, but George Lucas, kind of the last person anyone ever thinks of as an actor's director, somehow did. But what's truly wild about Han is that, again, the film has now been running for 45 minutes or so, and our prism through which to view the entire thing is about to radically shift again. Because Han Solo is different from all of the other characters we've met up to this point in that he's brazenly contemporary. Don't everybody thank me at once. 
Luke is an old-time young man in war protagonist. Vader and Obi-Wan are medieval. The rest of the Empire are vaguely period drama British. The aliens are pretty alien for the most part. 3PO and R2 are practically a vaudeville routine. But Han Solo is basically just some guy from right here, right now. Right here, right now, meaning, of course, 1977 in the United States. He's the first fully normal person we've met in the entire movie. Not necessarily directly relatable to all of the audience, but certainly to what Hollywood of the time would have thought of as the most of the audience, definitely whatever everyone will recognize as the default protagonist of most other movies, especially as having contemporary seeming guys be the heroes regardless of setting was in vogue at the time, a la M.A.S.H., Butch and Sundance, whatever. So just when Star Wars is aesthetically turning back into something incredibly offbeat, alien, even avant-garde in the cantina, in pops this character who, except for a couple items of clothing, the occasional made-up dumb space word in his dialogue, and the alien Sasquatch monster sidekick, almost feels like a real, regular dude who just wandered in off the street and sat down in the movie. Now, this has an immediate practical function of giving you a reason to regard Han as trustworthy and a good guy, even though he keeps doing and saying things that make him clearly not a good guy or trustworthy, which makes him ambiguous and therefore cool. <laughs> But if you watch close, Han doesn't just have the general poise and affect of an average, random, then-contemporary, late-70s white dude who jumped into a sci-fi movie. He kinda acts like it, too. <laughs> Pokey religions and ancient weapons are no match for a good blaster at your side, kid. Now, I'm not in any way suggesting that Han Solo is some kind of meta-ironic backdoor fourth wall breaker, not by a long shot, but whereas Luke is clearly the audience identification character and 3PO and R2 are frequently the audience POV characters because they're often on the sidelines watching the heroes just like we are, Han is frequently cast as the audience co-heckler, the that's what I do guy. Up to this point, audience that had sifted through the deliberately alienating weirdness and worked out that they were basically watching an Errol Flynn movie with a bunch of space bullshit soldered onto it had also likely absorbed that it wasn't being particularly subversive of the heroic adventure aesthetic otherwise, especially as these severely arch main characters were concerned. The impetuous young hero, the wise mentor, the dastardly villains, and the rest more or less play by the rules of the genre and color inside the lines. But then Han Solo shows up and he doesn't. What are you looking at? I know what I'm doing. Han just doesn't look, talk, and carry himself like a regular dude visiting Star Wars from the real world. He acts like it. He's the first person we hear be normal sarcastic instead of British theater smug like that one Imperial guy Vader force chokes. Listen, if you were to rescue her, the reward would be... What? Well, more well than you can imagine. I don't know, I can imagine quite a bit. When he improvises something, it's like a real person improvising and not that I've got a special backup plan just for this situation adventure movie improvisation. Uh, uh, everything's under control, situation normal. What happened? Uh, hit a slight weapons malfunction, but uh, everything's perfectly all right now. We're fine, we're all fine here now, thank you. How are you? He's as dismissive of the New Age goofiness presented to him as the Force as most of the mainstream audience was of real-life New Agey bullshit that it was being drawn from. Kid, I've flown from one side of this galaxy to the other. I've seen a lot of strange stuff, but I've never seen anything to make me believe there's one all-powerful force controlling everything. And most famously, he's the character who most colors outside the lines of the genre-prescribed good guy, bad guy dynamic. What good's your reward if you ain't around to use it? Besides, attacking that battle station ain't my idea of courage. It's more like... suicide. In other words, Han isn't just cool because Han is cool, he's cool because now having made it to the bottom of Star Wars' strange new weirdness factor, and yeah, the seedy bar full of monsters underscored by alien jazz is the weirdest, most avant-garde point in the movie by far, you're now presented with a new character who reacts to all of this, kinda like you would, and the effect of that cuts in both directions. The audience's oh thank god someone normal relief is borrowed as a shortcut to likability so Han can be roguish and still a good guy without needing an extraneous backstory for a while, but it's also a legitimate tension release measure for the various suspensions and indulgences Star Wars is going to continue to ask of its audience. Okay, yeah, we made you get acclimated to how weird this is for 45 minutes, give or take, but now that you're on board, it's totally fine not to take it too seriously. Hell, even outside all the space stuff, if you're just not totally down with all this old-timey knights and wizards, chivalry, honor, Jedi, dark side, light side, white hat, black hat nonsense, that's cool too. There's also guys like this here who don't give a shit either. Look. 
your worshipfulness. Let's get one thing straight. I take orders from just one person, me. In a sense, Han's position as the sort of normal person who lives in Star Wars becomes an axis on which the rest of the film's reality pivots, and it's used to deepen our understanding of the other characters beyond their archetypes in relation to him. Without Han around, it would still be novel that Leia herself also turns out to be a sarcastic, mouthy, proactive, gets her hands dirty person. So one day he's still alive. Will somebody get this big walking carpet out of my way? No reward is worth this. But since we don't get to see her behave like that until after she's rescued, when she has dialogue with people other than Vader and Tarkin, and we've met implicit visitor from contemporary reality Han, the effect isn't simply, oh, she's different, but can be taken as a specific character detail. She's sort of a normal person, too, and what we've seen before was a politician, a diplomat specifically, being a politician. You hear nothing? You're braver than I thought. Nice, come on. See also Obi-Wan. Han is a dick about the Force, Kenobi just kinda lets it roll right off of him. Han is clearly a dangerous guy who Luke doesn't fully trust, Kenobi knows that sometimes those are the dudes you need in a war. But who's gonna fly it, kid? You? You bet I could. I'm not such a bad pilot myself. We don't just sit here and listen. Remember, our screen time with Obi-Wan Kenobi starts with meeting him through the eyes of a kid who's going to be impressed by anything, and ends with his apparent death not long after that, so the implied mutual badasses from different school status opposite Han is pretty much our main source of solidifying that this really is the guy in however many hours it is between those two events. You can't win, but there are alternatives to fighting. And of course, in setting up that it's Luke who will be getting this big romantic hero moment with the princess, which we didn't know was weird at the time because they hadn't decided that it was weird yet. That was so wrong. Is a nice subtle way of letting us know that Luke is not as incapable in manhood as he'd appeared. Do you think a princess and a guy like me? No. Bear in mind, this was 1977. Action heroes of movies the scale of Star Wars generally weren't guys like Luke Skywalker. They were guys like Han Solo. The number two movie that year was Smokey and the Bandit, which actually is kind of strangely similar to Star Wars in weirdly specific parallel ways, but that's another show. So having a traditional movie hero show up but still decisively say, nah, Luke is still the hero, is another strong, subversive use of Han. That's an attention getter. And there you have it, Han Solo, the final and in many ways key point in the embrace versus alienation puzzle that Star Wars used to, I thought pretty hard and I don't think I'm exaggerating, pull the audience fully into a fantasy world like no film had managed to do since The Wizard of Oz. Yeah, this is weird, we know, but stick with it, because once you get used to it, it's really fun here. I mean, look, here's the coolest dude you've ever seen, and he's having a good time, right? <laughs> And while, again, I'm not here to talk about the rest of Star Wars, there is probably something to the common observation that the lack of a Han Solo-esque never-tell-me-the-odds character is one of the big reasons that the prequel trilogy didn't work as well. And by that same token, you might be given to think that killing Han off in the new Star Wars trilogy was making the same mistake, since in the 21st century it might feel more necessary than ever to include a character who seems like an ordinary person, who's detached from the bigger intergalactic machinations, engages the other characters the way a member of the audience might, in general feels like a normal, average, perhaps even implicitly working-class, real-world man or woman dropped suddenly into the Star Wars universe as a connection point for the audience and... Oh. Don't freak out, we're not here to talk about Rose Tico. We're not here to talk about The Last Jedi. We're not here to talk about people who are way too mad at either of those things for creepy reasons. Not gonna talk about Ryan Johnson. Not gonna talk about Kathleen Kennedy. Not gonna talk about the Walt Disney Corporation. What we are gonna talk about are themes. Every movie, every single one, has themes, mainly because every narrative has themes, and almost all films are narrative films, and even those that are not still have themes, because even the most abstract film imaginable is still made up of visuals, and every visual communicates its own mini-narrative, also known as an idea. That doesn't mean that every film is trying to send a message, or several messages, or that every message is whatever this or that political commentator, editorialist, philosopher, academic, or person on YouTube pretending to be any combination of those things says it is. It simply means that one, all stories are about about things. Two, most stories are about more than just the events that they describe. Three, Star Wars is a story about more than the events it describes. That more is what we call themes. Great shot, kid! That was one in a million! Remember, the Force will be with you. Always. 
Some of those themes we've touched on already have been discussed elsewhere in the popular culture to the point of literal white noise. There's a class theme around Luke as a farmer who wants to go where the action is. There's the obvious spiritual theme with the force and the push-pull between believing in it or not. There's a father-son familiar honor theme with Luke, Obi-Wan, and whatever we're allowed to know of Anakin carried over from mythological illusions. There's the very fact of morally ambiguous rogue Han Solo being so crucial to the eventual victory against the dark side in an otherwise strict good versus evil battle that makes very ambiguity a theme unto itself. Before that theme leaks more prominent to the forefront in The Empire Strikes Back. More pointedly, there's also racism. Hey, we don't serve their kind here. What? Sexism. I don't know who you are or where you came from. But from now on, you do as I tell you, okay? The importance of institutional order. The last remnants of the Old Republic have been swept away. Honoring treaties. Continue with the operation. You may fire when ready. What? You're far too trusty. Religious intolerance. Don't try to frighten us with your sorcerer's ways, Lord Vader. Your sad devotion to that ancient religion has not helped you conjure up the stolen data tapes, or given you clairvoyance enough to find the rebel's hidden fort. What? Yeah, look, I knew he's the bad guy, that's the point. There's plenty of perfectly legitimate reasons to shit on Darth Vader. You don't need to give him shit about where he goes to church on Sunday. Right? Just me? <clears throat> anyway, there's one theme that's bigger than all of these others, hangs over the whole franchise, but probably the original more so than others, and may well have had more to do with how Star Wars broke out and why people didn't necessarily see it coming. Want a hint? Well, it's subtle, but they did put it in the title. Star Wars is about war. It's set during a war. Most of its important characters are active participants in one side or the other of that war. Several of its primary locations are military craft and or installations in that war. It's a main narrative, involves dealing with a military operation to disable a weapon of war, its hero wants to run off and fight in a war, his mentor is a veteran of a previous, apparently related war, even the arc of Han Solo's anti-hero ambiguity turns largely on his willingness to participate in said war. War is the subject, the setting, the story, the backstory, the greater context, and the driving narrative force. Star Wars is a war movie and also a movie that's all about war. It's fantastic. Which is why the dumbest damn thing that nerd culture in general and Star Wars fandom in particular has ever tried to convince itself of is that Star Wars was never about politics. Of course it was. It's about war, right there in the title, and war is always about politics because war is probably the first thing human beings figured out how to do as an organized group, and politics is pretty much still just war reworked into a form where you don't have to do as much property repair or bury as many bodies when you're done. Now Lord Vader will provide us with the location of the rebel fortress by the time this station is operational. We will then crush the rebellion with one swift stroke. And before you ask about that super duper goofy Marvel movie that just also had war in its title, well, the jacked up purple space monster in Infinity War's big supervillain plan is to kill half the universe in order to avert the potential for famine due to resource scarcity. This is an explicitly political stance. In fact, it's a much more explicitly political stance than anything anyone takes in most of the Star Wars movies. Hell, it's actually a real world political philosophy called Malthusianism. Look it up. But like I said, that should be obvious. They put it in the title, which is why I'm being dismissive about it. What's more interesting is the way Star Wars chooses to be about war and the context in which that choice resonated back in 1977, specifically with the 1977 American audiences who saw it first and reacted most strongly. Without rehashing the world that shaped the boomers thing for the 900th time, because goddamn, you don't want to watch a newsreel montage set to Fortunate Son and or All Along the Watchtower, I don't want to edit a newsreel montage set to Fortunate Son and or All Along the Watchtower. <laughs> What a shrill, pointless decade. Suffice it to say, the U.S. had been out of Vietnam for four years, the war had been over for a period of two years, Nixon had been gone for three years, Martin, Malcolm, Johnny, and Bobby had all been assassinated roughly a decade ago, give or take. The Cold War was very cold. Relevant to the subject at hand, many of the chief creative forces behind the making of Star Wars were of age for either the potential or reality of Vietnam War service to have been a major presence of their early adulthood, and the 1960s to early 70s culture war where said war was among the most significant dark clouds rolling through the ether. War, or to get more narrow, violence, 
violence is always going to be an attractive subject for drama because A, it's probably always going to be part of the human condition, and B, there really aren't too many better, more direct or effective ways to communicate the narrative of two ideas in conflict than to create two avatars of said ideas and have them conflict. When I left you, I was but the learner. Now I am the master. Only a master of evil, not. <laughs> And the American film industry has always been uniquely shaped by war narratives and the heroic war narrative in particular. It was a nation founded in a war that decided its 20th century course as a metropolitan industrial rather than agricultural power in a war and established itself as a global superpower in a war. It was also young enough at the time, just a hair over 200 years old, to be mainly committed to those narratives as a default way of thinking about war still. So the moral, political, and ultimately boots on the ground indecisive quagmire the Vietnam War had, among all its other scars, left storytellers in something of a quandary in Hollywood. The appetite for stories of war and conflict was still there in the audience because it probably always will be, but what would otherwise have been the contemporary go-to context wasn't going to work, especially for the symbolic good triumphs over evil narratives war stories are typically so useful for. The wounds were still too open and raw, the opinions still too divided, and the conversation itself still too weary and exhausting to use contemporary to 1977 military settings for that kind of narrative. Continuing to go back to World War II, World War I, or further was starting to have diminishing returns and often made the experience feel like homework or listening to your grandparents instead of entertainment. And even apart from all of that, there was a palpable sense from a lot of the audience and film industry and cultural critics that the open sores of the Vietnam era were still so open that the idea of using any real-world setting for stories of action and violence in a flippant or hyper-unrealistic, just-for-fun, mass-audience entertainment way wasn't appropriate, period. If only there were some other setting you could drop an old-fashioned boy-goes-off-to-war adventure into, huh? One seemingly as far removed from any possible real-world context, but capable of including signifiers to connect with an audience in a similar direct way. Wouldn't that be something? You know of the rebellion against the Empire? That's how we came to be in your service, if you take my meaning, sir. Now, no one has ever suggested that George Lucas or anyone else set out to create more palatable version of a classical heroic war narrative in the making of Star Wars, and I won't be doing it here. Indeed, it doesn't appear to have been on anyone's mind, but it is effectively what the filmmakers ended up doing. The myriad ways in which Star Wars transforms war itself into a conceptual thematic abstraction and the most familiar and in many cases personally affecting visual reference points of war movies into interchangeable touchstones capable of being remixed independent of their original context is at once ingenious, devious, brilliant, troubling, and utterly key to its success. <laughs> In liberating the war narrative from direct connection to the real-world consequences while retaining exactly enough familiar echo of cinematic reality, Star Wars heroes and villains are allowed to free associate between multiple historic, literary, film, and television and military reference points in whatever way best suits the thematic demands of a given scene regardless of original context, effectively allowing the audience to experience a war narrative at its most visceral without the constraints of real-world context or the complications of real-world nuance. The Empire are a terrifying age of exploration armada rolling up on smaller vessels when we first meet them in the opening chase, an occupying colonial army and or pain in the ass cops on Tatooine, with some fairly hard to miss heavy handed allusions to a fairly standard late 70s film school kids conception of American overzealousness in Vietnam, ahem, they can have the fumbling bureaucratic legalism of post-Stalinist Soviet apparatchiks when they need to seem grotesquely arrogant, and the terrifying precision of Nazis at Nuremberg when they need to seem like a legitimate threat. Darth Vader is the Black Knight, the Red Baron, an overdecorated fascist goon, and a samurai warlord. The Death Star is Tokyo under the Doolittle Raid, and the Enola Gay. Don't get mad at me. Think about it. It tracks. The Rebellion gets the same treatment on the good guy side, most obviously where it concerns Leia. She's a princess, thus making the Star Wars, at least in part, feel like an old-world European Clash of Empires conflict, but she's also a diplomat when it wants to borrow the more current-feeling language of a politicized conflict. The Rebellion is alternately referred to as an alliance, very official-sounding, implications of grand-scale conflict for grand-scale scenes, but it's also just the Rebels whenever Star Wars wants to recenter on the main characters and remind the audience it's about scrappy, implicitly youth-aligned underdogs striking a desperate blow against authoritarianism. Under the leadership of a hereditary monarch and the armed, licensed-to-kill representatives of an elite religious caste, Luke Skywalker is a rebellious youngster who joins a resistance movement and also an idealistic farm boy who joins the Air Force. He learns the hard truth that war is unromantic and touches violently into the home front, that good and evil are not as clearly defined as he'd believed, and to embrace a meditative New Age philosophy of inner peace and pacifism, which he uses to become the best fighter pilot in the galaxy and blow up the Death Star, killing probably over a million people. The first Death Star was manned by the Imperial Army. The only people on board were stormtroopers, dignitaries, Imperials. Basically. So when they blew it up, no problem. Evil's punished. 
And the second time around? The second time around, it wasn't even done being built yet. It was still under construction. Yes, science fiction films of both the pulp and serious variety had featured militaristic and even literal wartime themes before, but not before Star Wars had a fantastical conflict been so simultaneously evocative of tactile realism and recognizable reference point while also being completely detached from contemporary or historic consequence. On a thematic level, at least, everyone could place themselves on the side of the rebels, their enemies or obstacles on the side of the Empire, and thrill to the somehow universally appealing spectacle of watching these scrappy revolutionary guerrillas, who are also samurai, who are also New Age pacifists, who are also royalist counter-revolutionaries, who are also pirates, kind of, who are also the Air Force, take down the authoritarian, Soviet, Nazi, Nixonian, American, Western, Imperial, neo-colonial, militaristic bad guys and their planet-killing war machine representing whatever the hell big ultimate threat in the world represents to you. Star Wars did what many at the time believed either couldn't or shouldn't be achieved in then-modern American popular cinema in the aftermath of the Vietnam era. It made war fun again. War. It's fantastic. And that sounds a little dark, I know, maybe even a little negative. There's an argument to be made that it is negative, we'll get to that. But I mean it here more in a matter-of-fact sense. Humans have always seemingly told war stories and made entertainment of them in order to work out what appears to be part of our innate conflict drive. And whatever else he may have unleashed on the world in Star Wars, George Lucas undeniably created a new paradigm through which to explore that drive and achieve that catharsis. The realities of warfighting and the politics thereof had come home and been made flesh for too many in the audience to enjoy the spectacle of rooting for the good guys to blow away the bad guys in any remotely earthbound setting without being made to think of the extra complications and might make the scenario less enjoyable in the Vietnam era, and the rapturous response of audiences in 1977 gave to the attack on the Death Star likely represented nothing less than the experience of having finally found a film to restore that more innocent pre-Vietnam sensation. A chance at immersion not simply into nostalgia for old-time pulp serials, but for the secure and safe feeling of being able to cheer for good guys you like to wipe out bad guys you don't and not have to question it. It's not a mature impulse. All told, it's kind of a selfish one and also an understandable one in the context of the moment. And while great films like Star Wars endure for complex reasons, they blow up initially for these more visceral and pointed reasons. George Luke's Star Wars lifted us out of our sort of depression of the 70s and into an awareness and a focus on space and its possible future. This movie stood by itself. Bring it out too late, and it doesn't fit our imagination. You bring it out just as the war in Vietnam is ending, when America feels uncertain of itself, when the old stories have died, and you bring it out of that time, and suddenly it's a new game. Also, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to watch Star Wars. Star Wars making American popular culture feel better about flexing its muscles as a superpower again is probably its most enduring legacy outside of its own franchise brand. The aspect of the film that above all else can be argued gave birth to not just the blockbuster era, but the 1980s themselves and all that came with them. That's a discussion in itself, but we're here to focus on the film and its moments. So before we move on, there's one other quick issue to address that, well, honestly didn't fit anywhere else. Okay, I really, really, really hate this question. I feel like it's something that doesn't really get as hotly debated anymore because in many ways there's more than two big, long-running genre franchises with devout fandoms now, so that's nice, but once upon a time when I was coming up, you didn't get to call yourself a nerd unless you'd staked out a debating position on Star Wars versus Star Trek, which is the greater science fiction saga. And there was always the one smartass who wanted to make an already tedious circle jerk discussion worse by smugly declaring that the whole thing was pointless because because Star Wars doesn't actually count as science fiction. It's fantasy. Yes. Wow. You're an idiot. And uh, even the vague memory of the point at which I could have given enough of a shit about that kind of differentiation to get a headache from it is in fact giving me a headache. But since it does factor into somewhat how Star Wars became such a huge deal, we might as well sort it out. 
Damn. So, the Wars vs. Trek version of this question mainly turns on the idea that Star Wars has the Force, which is portrayed in terms of a very literal magic, and therefore the Star Wars universe is not strictly science-based. Now, my particular counter to that would be that the Force is depicted in part as a religious belief that not everyone in the universe adheres to or gives credence to, and plenty of recognized science fiction works feature a presumption of in-universe religious truth, C.S. Lewis' Space Trilogy, Madeline Langell's Wrinkle in Time, hell, even the entirety of Dune if you want to get into allegorical but not existent belief systems, you get the point. Also, yes, I know this ultimately becomes moot because Lucas went ahead and gave the mechanics of it a more explicitly soft science explanation in the prequels with the midi-chlorians, but nobody talks about that anymore and we're focusing on the first one anyway. Plus, the Force is not significantly different in terms of the way it's portrayed on screen from things like the Vulcan mind meld or really psychic or telekinetic phenomenon and hard sci-fi properties otherwise, where it's basically magic but it's not because we say so, and the way it's framed is pretty similar to Taoist practical magic rituals like Feng Shui or Geomancy, which fall among the same broad definition of pseudoscience that phenomena like that generally would. Point is, it's hardly a deal breaker as far as I'm concerned. I find your lack of faith disturbing. That being said, if I were to take off my pretending to take sad nerd pedantry even a little bit seriously hat for a moment, my real honest take is that of course Star Wars is science fiction because there's spaceships and robots and lasers and they run on fuel and electricity instead of magic or whatever and creatures are all just types of aliens instead of being demons or leprechauns and goblins or whatever and if you're gonna sputter and ooze about how that's just reducing things to arbitrary signifiers, well, yeah, how do you think genre works? Most of the time it's just for marketing and cataloging purposes anyway and sci-fi wasn't even called that until well into its pedigree as a genre. It's not that I don't understand the argument that science fiction should be defined as fiction that explores scientific concepts specifically, and if we're talking about carving up the roster within the sci-fi umbrella into subcategories of speculative fiction, theoretical fiction, dystopian versus utopian fiction, okay, that's one thing, but the whole notion of either emphatically separating hard and soft science fiction or just kicking any sci-fi that isn't explicitly grounded in hard science to the curb, which goes to a big sea change in the genre spearheaded by certain specific cliques of publishers and authors in the 40s and 50s that did push the genre forward in sub respects but also narrowed a lot of the acceptable perspectives just saying eventually means you're tossing out the foundations of the fucking genre jules verne hg wells all the early space adventure stuff that eventually leads to star wars from flash gordon to john carter hell you don't have to lose the first science fiction story period mary shelley wasn't particularly interested in the hard science as it concerned frankenstein all that business about tissue reanimation and sewing up dead bodies got added into the narrative when they made it into plays and movies when you read the book, it's more like alchemy than forbidden medicine, but now we're getting off track. In any case, the point is, as far as I'm concerned, yes, Star Wars is a work of science fiction, the one that connects in part because it cleverly incorporates allusions to elements of the fantasy genre, but also the need to declare it not often feels less about understanding its place in history of fiction and more about diminishing it in some way, as though being part of the sci-fi genre is an honorific the film doesn't deserve. And I've never bought into that any more than I've bought into the idea that the existence of a more fanciful, non-grounded science fiction like Star Wars or Flash Gordon somehow takes away from the ability of works like 2001 or Solaris or whatnot to be regarded as serious in their own right. And in fact, as much as I'm a professed fan of so-called hard science fiction, the objective truth of the matter is that however far back you want to go in calculating out a timeline for the genre as a whole, it was about ray guns and space monsters and time warps and hollow earths and essentially medieval fantasy and or colonialist adventure mythology transposed into someone's idea of outer space and or the future for much more of its existence than it was about theoretical quantum quantum physics as metaphors for the Oedipus complex or vice versa, which means it looked, read, and felt like Flash Gordon, Buck Rogers, John Carter, and Star Wars a lot longer than it did any of the supposed curatives, which helpfully is a decent segue into another often overlooked key to the original Star Wars success, that the cultural phenomenon that came out of nowhere didn't. As noted previously, a big part of Star Wars' success is its sense of timelessness. Apart from one's ability to discern the recency of certain special effects techniques and then contemporary hairstyles, it feels like something that could have existed at any point in time, but especially after it became such an overwhelming presence in popular culture, something that somehow must have always existed. It's genuinely difficult to remember a time before Star Wars or that there was a time before Star Wars, specifically in terms of its place within the shared cultural mythology. To wit, it's commonly stated as an article of common faith when explaining this very phenomenon that Star Wars' success 
success came out of nowhere. The 20th Century Fox thought they'd sunk money into another weird experimental piece from one of Francis Coppola's film school brat protégés, but that this one might make a little profit on the back end because sci-fi stuff was sometimes popular with children during daytime shows in certain months, and Alan Ladd Jr. and that Spielberg kid seemed to think it was worth something, so hey, why not? That 50s race car movie he did had done pretty good business. Grab that special one and jump into your candy-colored custom or your screaming machine, cruise downtown, and catch American Graffiti. American Graffiti? Baby, what's that? It's a movie. Can you dig it? Can you dig it? Go back in time. Where were you in 62? But then it comes out, and what the hell? People are lining up around the block. It's this huge deal. Apparently, a hundred or so different cultural factors, see previous sections, had all lined up like some kind of grand cosmic conjunction to create a scenario where this specific movie could fill dozens of desperate cultural, spiritual, mood-of-the-moment needs all at once that no one had managed to connect the dots on, not even Lucas, who was mostly just trying to get a story out of his system. No one, so goes the accepted version of events, saw this coming. In other words, Star Wars was a lucky break. The right movie at the right time, there was no possible way to know that a giant scale fusion of science fiction, high fantasy, orientalist pop spiritualism, and aesthetically depoliticized heroic war story pitched squarely at the narrative sensibilities of hyper-imaginative, sci-fi loving, action figure role-playing, comic book collecting, spaceship fantasizing ten-year-olds was the new blockbuster model the studio system had been looking for to replace what biblical epics, musical roadshows, and big star screwball comedies had been in the previous decades. I sense something, a presence I've not felt since... And even if some foresight cursed Cassandra in Hollywood had figured it out, no one on Madison Avenue or Wall Street was ever going to believe that those same ten-year-olds and the teenagers and eventual quote-unquote adults retaining the same sensibilities would end up being the new permanent driving force of the disposable income economy heading into the 80s and continuing up through, well, here we are. But the thing about this view of pop culture history vis-a-vis -vis Star Wars is, it's not right. This bickering is pointless. In fact, it's overlooking a key piece of what happened here. Star Wars' supposedly out-of-nowhere debut didn't so much represent the birth of the so-called geek culture as part of the pop mainstream so much as it represented the ascendancy of a consumer counterculture that had been steadily building for well over a decade. And since if you're watching this and there's still a planet, you probably already have a sense of what the impact of Star Wars was, and since the whole purpose of this exercise is to constrain ourselves to the original film rather than the franchise that exploded out of it, let us instead turn our attention to what was waiting to be impacted in Ground Zero 1977. As we just got done observing, the carefully executed timelessness of George Lucas' acute sense of the mythic ingrained in the original Star Wars makes it easy to forget that it's a relatively recent creation and not actually an ageless legend that's been with us forever, especially now that more and more of its fan base came of age after it was released than before and thus literally never knew a world without it. As such, it can be easy, if you don't have a reason to spend a lot of time thinking about such things especially, to lose track of how many different piecemeal elements of the so-called geek media and nerd culture collective experience that somehow feel adjacent to the post-Star Wars blast radius were actually either contemporary or significantly predated the original film, and yet an understanding of this is a vital and often missing component to the culture's overall grasp of how the Star Wars phenomenon came about. Yes. An elegant weapon for a more civilized age. Now, obviously, Star Wars fans of varying levels of commitment are already aware of previously noted direct acknowledged inspirations. The Flash Gordon serials, the comic strips that inspired them, the pulp adventures of Buck Rogers and John Carter that had in turn inspired those, E.E. E. Doc Smith's Lensman, Herc Herbert's Dune, Tolkien, Joseph Campbell, the myriad permutations of Arthurian mythology, Kurosawa's samurai films, and God only knows what other late 70s genre entertainment trends were bopping around inside the scattered imagination of a young filmmaker occasionally considered the weird one in a buddy group that included Brian De Palma and John Milius. But apart from the popular and not-so-popular genre artifacts that personally informed George Lucas, recall for a moment that the following rundown is just a sampling of things that you might not often think of as having been playing out in the worlds of sci-fi and fantasy fandom before Star Wars, but very much were. Apes. 20th Century Fox transforms the motion picture screen into Planet of the Apes. 
Planet of the Apes. Yes, the very first big studio sci-fi mega franchise before Star Wars. Obviously, everyone knows the first one came out long before the Lucasfilms did, but remember that the franchise itself kept going with almost yearly sequels up through 1973, a TV show in 74, and an animated series in 75, meaning that this series and the idea of a sprawling multimedia film, television, comic book, and merchandising empire themed around a singular sci-fi continuity was very much part of the public imagination before Star Wars popped on everyone's radar. Star Trek. Well, there's a big one right there. And again, yes, everyone knows the original series had come and gone a decade prior to Star Wars. However, even though the franchise wouldn't reach the big screen until after Star Wars made the big budget sci-fi thing a profitable endeavor again, as with Planet of the Apes, the popularity of Trek had helped create what was becoming the shared collective experience of the fandom consumer culture. While science fiction and comic book conventions had existed in some form since the mid-50s and early 60s, if not earlier, dedicated Trek conventions came of age in the 70s and helped push the continued ongoing popularity of the franchise through tie-in comics, books, the 1973 animated series, which is actually pretty cool if you've never given it a chance, but that's another show, and similarly themed media chasing the same audience. Robert E. Howard and Conan. This will make sense in a moment. I imagine most people who are aware that Conan the Barbarian was a character in a series of pulp sword and sorcery stories before it was a Schwarzenegger movie also know that said stories are significantly older than Star Wars. Semi-topical sidebar, it also feels weird that Conan is so much older than Lord of the Rings, right? Like, neither of them feel particularly wedded to a time and place, but something about Tolkien always feels authentically ancient, where Howard trends toward perpetual contemporariness, right? Something about the use of language, I imagine imagine. However, what are many are less aware of is that like most pulp authors of his era, Howard had a pretty limited long-term readership in his own era. The Conan stories in particular didn't have significant pop culture renaissance until the high fantasy genre exploded in the mid to late 60s and early 70s, a phenomenon that many attribute to the popularity of new generation fantasy art popularized by Frank Frazetta used to market the new editions of his books, which in turn contributed to a fresh rise in action-heavy storytelling in the fantasy and sci-fi genre in general and had a major influence on the emergence of Dungeons and Dragons. There is, of course, some dispute as to the actual origin point of Dungeons and Dragons and role-playing games like that in particular, but in the terms of the owlbear shit hitting the blade barrier, original D&D hits in 1974, and then TSR puts out the basic set, and then AD&D in 1977, the same year as Star Wars, effectively taking what up to that point may indeed have been the shadowiest of what we now call the geek community's shadowy subcultures, role-playing and wargaming, and blowing it out into one more widely circulated, mass-marketed, and monetized arm of the hobby shop economy, where you may have found it sharing shelf space with... Metal Erlant, or Heavy Metal, introduced a generation of readers to bold new visions of adult-oriented sci-fi in both art and storytelling starting in 1974, and one would be hard-pressed to imagine a strain of the genre it did not leave its stamp on in some way. And speaking of illustrated fiction where to even begin. By the time have you heard about this movie called Star Wars first crept into comic book store conversations, Gwen Stacy had already been killed, meaning the entire Silver Age was effectively over already. That's a big one. Roy Thomas' Kree Skrull War storyline was six years old in 1977. Jim Starling's Captain Marvel and Warlock stories had already happened. The new version of the X-Men had debuted in 1975. In fact, the heavily outer space warfare-centric Phoenix Saga was half over by the time Star Wars hit. Sticking with that epics in outer space theme, Jack Kirby's New Gods tenure had come and gone at DC, his decidedly simmer Eternals books were in mid-run at Marvel, as was his 1976 very different adaptation and expansion of 2001 A Space Odyssey, which brought the lore aspect of the Arthur C. Clarke story back into a semi-prominent nerd culture discussion space where Stanley Kubrick had opted to downplay that aspect in the film. And speaking of film... <laughs> We've already covered the way Star Wars pushed the Space Age movies into a new era by marrying A-tier sci-fi special effects to so-called B-tier sci-fi storytelling, but it's important to remember that even though the marked visible shift from the Hollywood standard being something like Logan's run to Star Wars was Star Wars, some of the machinations were already in place, though yes, who can say if everything would have lined up without it? Silent Running had applied quasi-realism to both used universe and friendly robot concepts, the project that would eventually become Alien had been in development since Dan O'Bannon's collaboration with John Carpenter and Ron 
Colin Cobb on Dark Star. Steven Spielberg's Close Encounters was, of course, practically a concurrent production. And over at Warner Brothers, Superman had been in active development since 1973 and in production since 1975, even though it wouldn't release until over a year after Star Wars. And we haven't even mentioned that this was in the initial ascendancy of early video games, which were hitting a milestone that same year and had originated with a heavy sci-fi influence. The first one literally being Space Wars in 1962. Look, this could honestly just keep going, but I imagine the point is made. This swirling melange of cultural influences was effectively the landing strip that had been laid out for Star Wars approach. It's just that neither the film nor the strip knew anything about one another. For all the attention paid to how immediately Star Wars interfaced with, overwhelmed, and supercharged the realms of underground nerd culture and the youth entertainment scene, ultimately fusing them into a singular media-dominating market force, the likes of which the world had never seen before, what's remarkable is how uncynically it arrived there. The studio thought they were buying a laser light show to entertain teenagers for a couple weekends. George Lucas thought he was shrewdly getting a studio to pay him to realize a hodgepodge of his dreams and obsessions in the guise of selling them a laser light show. No one was actually trying to land dead center in the Venn diagram of exactly what popular culture had apparently been looking for at exactly that moment in time. But that's what they did. And after all this, looking back on the whole thing, it's impossible for me to even consider disputing that Star Wars succeeded because it gave popular culture the film that it didn't even know that it wanted. But the question is, was it the film that it needed? I feel something terrible has happened. Ah. Uh, 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 okay, all right. I'm I'm out of different kinds of deep heavy sighs, but can you blame me? I see your point, sir. You know, the whole reason I had trepidation about doing this in the first place is that the only thing that's been more played out and picked over than dissertations about how Star Wars changed the movies is dissertations about how Star Wars ruined everything. I mean, what can be said that you haven't already heard? The flip side of living in a globalized popular culture that recognized and permanently commodified the unique insight that the narrative and aesthetic fixation of youth offer on mass appeal storytelling is living in a globalized popular culture that is in many ways occupying a state of perpetual adolescence, and that's probably not a healthy way to organize a society and maybe isn't entirely disconnected from how TV characters get elected president and how I I, for example, can reach 37 years of age, have been living on my own for quite a while, make a not insubstantial name for myself in my chosen field of media, and still find myself saying things like, oh, that's why you sweep and then mop. Okay, fine, fair enough. Not even Xena is a match for the limited edition double-edged lightsaber from Star Wars, Episode One: The Phantom Menace. <laughs> If it's true that part of Star Wars' grand achievement in connecting with an audience was recognizing a raging and apparently yet unsatiated desire in the contemporary Western psyche to return to a state of adolescent or younger security and fanning the flames thereof for all that's worth, that same instinct probably has a lot to do with why we overindulge in superficial versions of extended youth and continue to elect craven and mendacious leaders because they play action figure dress-up and also like to play with toys and that's not good. I'm skeptical that if Star Wars hadn't done it that some other force wouldn't have come along and done the same in its place, but if you had your grade book and red pen out waiting for me to mention that one, there it is. Like I said, I don't mean to be dismissive, but you don't need me or this show if you're looking for a diatribe about how kickstarting and soldering into place blockbuster franchise, toy line, fandom, Ouroboros of modern popular culture is a sin against humanity, art, and society for which Star Wars and its progenitors will never be forgiven. It's been said since the first Vader dolls hit the shelves. It'll be said now more than ever that it's an unending Disney thing, and fanboys of the particularly toxic variety have discovered the joys of performative anti-consumerism as a new favorite cudgel. It's an old argument with some points, but not all of the points, and I suspect you're as tired of hearing about it as I am trying to find a new spin on it. Merchandising, where the real money from the movie is made. Space Falls the t-shirt. Space Falls the coloring book. Space Falls the lunchbox. Space Falls the breakfast cereal. Space Falls the flamethrower. <laughs> That kids love this one. You see, the thing is, to be totally honest with you, at this point, I'm less concerned with what Star Wars has done to us than what we've done to Star Wars. 
handful of times through what is now something of a behemoth of a piece, I've described Star Wars both in terms of the original film under discussion primarily and the franchise as subversive. And it occurs to me that word gets misused and misunderstood an awful lot. It doesn't necessarily have to mean revolutionary or carry some kind of self-critical affectation. It merely means, when applied to a work of art, that the work under consideration calls into question challenges or otherwise goes against the grain of convention. You can't win, but there are alternatives to fighting. The place of Star Wars in popular culture is often misapplied, deliberately so, to be part of a return to traditionalism, a reassertion of the cultural status quo after the tumult of the 60s and 70s. I imagine the preceding segments of this piece have done their part to dispel this in the broader sense, i.e. how the franchise began and remained very much a part of the counterculture despite later attempts to claim it by reactionary forces in the 80s and onward. Suffice it to say, no, the movie about a cobbled together rebel army of college-age, shaggy-haired kids bringing down cosmic fascism with the power of space Buddhism was not on the right flank of anything. But the reason Star Wars politics are so often misread is because it's approached to storytelling is itself similarly so. It's read as a work of big C conservative myth-making because we've allowed ourselves to indulge a reading of Lucas' approach to mythic storytelling that's not just overly simplistic but outright incorrect, one that holds up Star Wars as merely transposing the futuristic dressing onto classical mythic structure. In this reading, part of the reason for the film's success becomes the reassertion of traditionalist themes within those unchanged structures into modernity, which would make sense, except that's not what the film does at all. As demonstrated previously, its narrative structure subverts the traditional dramatic framework. Luke is every bit a subversion of the traditional hero archetype, as Han is of the rogue and Leia is of the damsel in distress. Yes, Star Wars, much like the other film school generation blockbuster projects like Raiders, Jaws, Godfather, etc., was born of a young filmmaker recreating the kind of entertainment that thrilled him in youth, but it also came from the instinct to improve upon the material, to rework it, rebuild it, shape it into something that spoke more strongly to the world it was entering into. Star Wars wasn't simply bigger and more expensive looking than any other sci-fi fantasy production that had launched before, it was fundamentally a different creature. The characters weren't just the same old recycled archetypes, the plot didn't paint by numbers, it didn't play by any of the rules, not of the previous movies, not of the sci-fi genre, not of earlier myths, folklore, or Joseph Campbell's analyses thereof. There's no mystical energy field controls my destiny. It's all a lot of simple tricks and nonsense. And I fundamentally believe that one of the reasons Star Wars has stuck around, even as so much other stuff in seemingly the same mold sprung up in its wake, was that it was so feverishly committed to being a singular, weird, different thing. But as a culture, as an audience receiving it, it feels more and more like too much of our response has been to take this strange, unique, special thing that was Star Wars and make it less so at almost every turn. Well, we've learned if you don't like something, just go to the office and complain. Whoa! Oh, 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 I'll give you money! Oh, okay, I'm going to tell! Oh, oh. We tell ourselves that it's simple and traditional and that it marked an endpoint for the counterculture in the cinema rather than an elevation, that the rope pulp militarism but in space cliches of the genre that Star Wars flouted, deconstructed, and outright ignored as a film franchise get aggressively reinserted throughout the so-called expanded universe, as do taciturn, square-jawed action heroes the likes of which the original film pointedly avoids centering, as did the prequels, as do the new trilogy thus far. Star Wars is always, well, extra, and we love it for that, but then we always start asking it to be less for some reason. Not deliberately or maliciously so, maybe not in ways that can be helped. It's possible that Star Wars was so different, is still so different, that we can't try to not shape it into something more familiar and tangible to make sense of it beyond the margin. But it's a shame nonetheless that so many of the supposedly most egregious cultural sins that can be laid at Star Wars' feet are simply not anything in the film. They're sins that have been projected onto it by a culture that only claims to fully grasp it. It's criticized for being too simple when it's anything but, chastised as pro-war when the reality is much more complicated, alternately derided or celebrated for a traditionalism that it actively deconstructs, shamed as a force of empty consumers' greedmongering because the commercial success it engendered for merchandise, which is sort of like blaming molecular oxygen for a house fire. Surprising? No, not really, but sad all the same. Star Wars is a weird, wonderful oddity that we probably couldn't help but render tacky and tawdry in our subsequent appreciation, and then we get mad at it for what we twisted it into, and more recently even matter when it tries to reassert what it really was all along, but that's a different show. No! Well, that meandered just a bit, didn't it? Vaporators. Sir, my first job was programming binary load lifters. Very similar to your vaporators in most respects. Can you speak, Pachi? Of course I can, sir. It's like a second language to me. I'm a yeah, all right, shut up. Granted, some of that was because there were a couple different life changes I didn't expect in the offing that made this episode delayed by like a year, and thus it got a little longer in a perhaps misguided attempt to deliver more content and make up for the wait. And also, as I said before, more so than any other episode in the series, the question feels perfunctory to the subject. Of course Star Wars is really that good. Most people already know that about Star Wars, 
without having had to watch Star Wars, its presumed validity as part of the cultural fabric. Even still, I found myself gaining a few new and different layers of appreciation for the film and its place in our collective unconscious upon revisiting it for this piece, and I hope I've given you cause to do the same. The purpose of this series is never to argue a point that's already been made, as much as to explore the reasoning behind it, to delve into the why so much more than the whether or not something was worthwhile in the first place. And when it comes to Star Wars, the place I kept coming back to is that there's just so much more than even those of us who claim to love it most often want to admit there is. Even now, here at the end, I'm not entirely sure why that is. Do we think it's going to fall apart on examination, that it'll lose whatever it means specifically to us if we acknowledge that it intends meaning of its own? The Force will be with you. Always. Maybe that is the problem. The secret to the original Star Wars was always that it feels big, but it's actually kind of small. Model spaceships and old flashlights instead of grand old Hollywood sets pretending to be sprawling spectacle. A handful of main characters and lots of interchangeable extras scurrying around in uniforms in a dozen or so significant locations. A broader mythology so thinly sketched most of its proper nouns hadn't been plugged in yet. It attains a sense of scale and scope through its agreeable acknowledgement of its own influences, but like a pop culture prism, it refracts those influences outward into a wider projection of its own. That's why thus far it felt a little pointless to dig around in the newer Star Wars movies asking, which of these people is the Luke? Which is Han? Where's the Chewie? Let the Wookiee win. <laughs> The original Star Wars was such a thorough rewriting of the cultural dialect that almost every major pop fiction work or character sense carries some strand of its DNA in some fashion or another. Neo and Captain America and Harry Potter are the Luke just as certainly as Tony Stark and Martin Riggs are the Han, and everyone from Ripley to Sarah Connor to Elsa to Shuri to Carol Danvers are a little bit Leia. As much as it's true that this is in part an effect of Star Wars drawing from classical archetype, it means something that it supplanted nearly all previous points of reference that fed into it not only within its own genre or across its own medium, but throughout an entire popular culture landscape. It's likely that pop mythologists have come to overstate the degree to which George Lucas' singular idiosyncratic vision exists as a sum total of everything that came before it, but it's much more true, especially in mainstream Hollywood and especially now, that it's in the totality of everything that's come since. The last remnants of the Old Republic have been swept away. But for all that it's done to permeate the fabric of our discourse, it's all the more remarkable that you really can still, more so than any of the subsequent entries in the series, even the ones that are supposed to be better, watch Star Wars in isolation and be impressed by how, well, watchable it is, how easy it is to get caught up in the weird little details, enjoy the goofy puppet aliens, watch the robots bumble around in the desert, hum along to the soaring music, soak in the strange but lived-in atmosphere of the cantina or the falcon, thrill along to the rescue of the Death Star and get all swept up in that big strafing run finale. The damn thing just works. After all this time, Star Wars is really that good. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. I disagree. I disagree. <laughs>